praise God for all. And from our hymnal, page 363, and can it be that I should gain, and we'll do verses 1, 4, and 5. Let's pray as we approach God's word together. <clears throat> Father, that has been our theme song throughout the whole series of Romans. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Father, we thank you for your love, for the forgiveness you offer, and for the, the assurance that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We ask you to be our teacher this morning and continue your work of making us more like your son. I ask these things in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible or your Bible app, I invite you to open to the book of Romans, the 16th chapter. This is my 30th and final message in this series on Romans. 
and what a journey it has been for us. Uh, Chapter 16 is all about family, Paul's spiritual family in particular. He ends this rich epistle filled with all of this great doctrine with a list of names. 26 of them, to be exact, most of whom we know nothing about. And that's why many Bible teachers will ignore this chapter. I thought about doing that, but there's an obvious truth that I don't want us to miss, and that's this. Paul was not a Lone Ranger Christian. He did not minister alone. He always had a team of believers around him to help him spread the gospel and build Christ's church. And that brings up a question. How connected are you to your spiritual family? Think about it. One author put it this way, who's holding your trampoline? I'm referencing a book by Donald Joy entitled Bonding, Relationships in the Image of God. In the first chapter of his book, he talks about our need for relationships when life gets hard and life starts bouncing us up and down. He says that every person needs four support groups, one on each side of the trampoline. They need family, relatives, friends, and acquaintances. By family, he's referring to your immediate family, your parents, children, spouses, perhaps brothers and sisters, if you're close. By relatives, he means family members who are a bit more distant than that, um, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents. The third group he mentions is friends. These are growing, active, solid relationships that we can count on. And the fourth group he mentions is associates. These could be neighbors, co-workers, people we go to church with. Now, according to Joy, these four groups represent a person's support system. And that support system becomes really important when a crisis comes. Now, think about it. How many people in your life can you rely on in a crisis? Paul counts 28 of them. 26 of whom are named for us. And that's just in this letter. There were more. According to Joy, as well as other researchers, a healthy support system has at least 12 people you can count on. And very often, many of these people know each other. That is a healthy support system. A neurotic system, as he puts it, has about 6 to 11 people in it, and they don't necessarily know each other. A psychotic system has only a few people that you can rely on. So obviously, the greater your support network, the healthier you will be when challenges come your way. As we look at Romans chapter 16, here's the question I want us to consider this morning. How do you treat your family? And by family, I'm talking about your spiritual family, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul gives us three answers to that question here. He says, be welcoming, be honoring, and be discerning. First, be welcoming. Verse 1, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sencrea, that you may receive her or welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and a sister in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many, and of myself also. Now, I love the fact that the first person he mentions in his list of associates is a woman. Now, that's notable because of the Greco-Roman culture that he was a part of. Uh, Phoebe is the first of nine women he mentions by name, four of whom are described as co-laborers in the Lord. I think this destroys the notion that Paul was a male chauvinist. He was not. The truth is, the Bible honors the role of women, though it was written at a time when women were not honored in society. Now, most ancient cultures, including the Greco-Roman culture that Paul was a part of, were male-dominated. Women were considered property of their husbands or their fathers. Jewish men could divorce their wives at any time for virtually any reason, but Jewish women did not have that right. In that culture, whenever a child was born, everyone hoped it was a boy. After all, boys had a much better chance of growing up and getting a job to contribute to the family. That's why they were valued. 
Let me share a portion of a letter that was written in 1 BC by a Greek laborer who heard that his wife was pregnant. Here's what he writes. If good luck to you, you have another child. If it is a male child, let it live. If it is a female, cast it out. He was referring to the common practice of taking unwanted babies and throwing them on the city dump. Children who survived being cast out were usually picked up by those who made them slaves or prostitutes. How different women were treated by Jesus Christ. He welcomed women, and there was always a group of women who followed him around and supported him in his ministry. In Luke chapter 8, verse 1, we read this. Jesus traveled about from one village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. So Jesus ministered to them, and they ministered to him. In fact, most of those who were with Jesus at the cross were, in fact, women. Most of his male followers had run away. Now, throughout Scripture, women played key roles in Israel's history, and I won't go into depth on it. Um, I can give you a few. The line of King David includes Ruth. She was a Gentile woman of great character. Uh, the preservation of the Jewish race can be credited to a Jewish woman named Esther. The story of our salvation begins with a godly teenager named Mary. Uh, there are many others. Now, in this passage, Paul begins his list of associates with Phoebe. Three things are said about her. First, Phoebe is called a sister. That describes her relationship in the church. Paul considered her family. Second, Phoebe is called a servant. That describes her role in the church. Interesting, the word Paul uses for servant is diakonos. It is the same word used to describe men who were deacons in Acts chapter 6. A deacon or a deaconess is a person who serves the church in practical ways. Church history tells us that a deaconess would do several different things, including visiting the sick and helping the poor. Third, Phoebe is called a helper. That describes her activity in the church. A better translation would be the word benefactor. It seems likely that she was someone who supported Paul's ministry out of her own means. And based on the context, it seems as if Phoebe was the one who actually carried this letter to Rome and delivered it to them. In verse 2, Paul says, Receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. That's how you treat family, right? You welcome them. Uh, the New Testament word for that is hospitality, making someone feel at home. That can include strangers as well as people we know. Someone once said, if the world seems cold, light a fire to warm it. I like that. Uh, this world can be a very cold and lonely place. So as Christians, we have a responsibility to be welcoming and hospitable to those we know and those we don't. And that brings us to the second way we should treat family. Be honoring. Be honoring. Verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachys. Greet Apelles, whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet those in the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me also. Greet Asyncretus, Phlegon, Hermes, 
Petrobus, Hermas, and the other brothers and sisters with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Ner Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the Lord's people who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. Let's drop down to verse 21. Timothy, my co-worker, sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason, and Sospiter, my fellow Jews. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, so he's the secretary for Paul, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole f church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and her brother Quartus sends you their greetings. Now, this list of names tells us something about Paul. He had a lot of friends. Um, he wasn't just a soul winner, he was a friend maker. We often picture Paul as this you know, nose-to-the-grindstone, tough-minded missionary who would get the job done at any price and didn't take a lot of time to invest in people. Not true. Nothing could be further from the truth. He had a lot of friends, and those friendships sustained him through the ups and downs of life. One of my favorite Proverbs is Proverbs 18.24. You know what it is? It says, A man who has friends must himself be friendly. Sometimes people wonder, why don't I have more friends? Well, could be you're just a grouch, and that's the reason why. Or maybe you just don't make the effort to invest in others. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. Well, what does that mean? A friendly person operates on the basis of supply rather than need. And we can choose to think this way. You know, I need this. I need that. Now, people are there to meet my needs. We can think that way. Or we can think this way. What can I do to help? Um, how can I meet their need? What can I say to encourage them today? It's a different way of thinking. We operate on the basis of supply rather than need. That's what friendly people do. They give of themselves to those around them. Remember Paul's words in Philippians 2. He said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Paul had friends because Paul was friendly. It's really that simple. And when we get to heaven, we're going to meet some of those friends of Paul's. So let me give you a little bit of information about them before you meet them. Uh, in verse 3, Paul mentions a couple, Aquila and Priscilla. This was a husband and wife team. And I think it's so cute that their names rhyme, don't you? They were originally from the city of Rome, but they were kicked out of Rome when Emperor Claudius expelled the Jews in 49 AD. At that point, they moved to the city of Corinth, which was a busy commercial center in Greece. And there they set up their tent-making business. Now, as Jews, they attended synagogue faithfully every Saturday. So when Paul came to Corinth as a missionary, what's the first thing he did? He visited the local synagogue, where he told Jews that the Messiah they'd been waiting for had come, and his name was Jesus. Now, in ancient times, people were often separated in synagogues. It's interesting. Men would sit on one side of the room, and women on the other. And people would sit in groups according to their trades or professions. So... Paul walks into the local synagogue, and he sits down in the tent maker section because he was a tent maker. And who does he sit beside? Some guy named Aquila. No, so they strike up a conversation, they find out they have a few things in common, and then Paul has the privilege of leading Aquila and his wife Priscilla to faith in Christ. By the time Paul writes this letter, the ban on Jews has been lifted, and Priscilla and Aquila are back in Rome, where they were from. In fact, verse 5 tells us that the church in Rome, or at least a part of that church, was meeting at their house. That's the way it was for the first 300 years of the church. Christians gathered for worship, prayer, fellowship, and teaching in private homes. When persecution became really fierce around 200 A.D., Christians were forced to abandon their homes and meet underground for a time. The persecution started subsiding around 300 A.D. That's when buildings began popping up as places of worship. But before that, the church met primarily in people's 
homes. When Justin Martyr was on trial for his faith in the third century, the Roman prefect asked him, where do Christians assemble? He said, we do not, as you suppose, meet in one place, for our God fills the heaven and the earth, and therefore he is present anywhere. We can meet any place and have communion and fellowship with him. When I go to Rome, I have a home where I go and remain. And those Christians who desire to hear me teach will come into that home. Right? So Christians met in people's houses. That happened for years. And when Paul wrote this, Aquila and Priscilla were hosting one of these gatherings. You know, millions of people still meet this way today all over the world. Uh, when COVID started shutting churches down, more and more of these little house churches began popping up, even in this country. And that's not a bad thing. You know, a small group is a great setting for fellowship and instruction. It's a great place for, to invite friends and neighbors who may never walk in to a traditional church. Now, there are a few more names I want to point out. In verse 9, we read, Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Now, Urbanus was a common name for slaves. It's where we get our English word urban, which means city. Urbanus literally means city bred. So Paul is probably referring to a slave who was born and raised in Rome. Now the next name he lists is Stachys, which is a very uncommon name. But there's one listing in antiquity that mentions a man named Stachys who was part of the royal household in Rome. Now personally, I don't think it's an accident that Paul mentions a slave and a person of nobility in the same sentence. He was no respecter of persons. He honored any person, anyone, who was a faithful follower of Jesus. Billy Graham used to say, the ground is always level at the foot of the cross. Um, if you are in the Lord, you are family, regardless of your background. And Paul demonstrates that in his writing. Verse 10, greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Uh, scholars believe Aristobulus was the brother of Herod Agrippa, the grandson of Herod the Great. Herodian was obviously related to Herod's family as well, perhaps an associate of Aristobulus. Narcissus was well known in Rome. He was very rich and very influential but he was also an ungodly man who was secretary to Emperor Claudius. Still, there were some in his household who heard the gospel and put their faith in Jesus. In verse 13, Paul mentions Rufus. Now, we get a little bit of insight into Rufus from Mark's gospel, which we believe was written in Rome. Isn't that interesting? In Mark 15, when Jesus was carrying his cross, he fell beneath the weight of it. You remember that? Which is not a surprise given the weight of the crossbeam and, and the suffering he had just endured at the hands of the Romans. Seeing he needed help, one of the Roman guards pointed to a bystander and told him to carry the cross. Do you remember the man's name? Anybody? Maybe I'm deaf, but I'm not hearing it. Simon of Cyrene, yeah. Mark tells us it was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. There would be no reason to mention Alexander and Rufus unless they were well known in the Roman church. So let's try to fill in the gaps as best we can. Simon, who carried Jesus' cross, and Mrs. Simon both came to faith in Christ, perhaps through this encounter with Jesus, and his resurrection three days later. When they had kids, they raised them to be Christ followers. And now this family was a part of the church at Rome. Now here's the point I want to make. Out of great calamity comes great opportunity. We see this again and again. What happened when Aquila and Priscilla were kicked out of Rome and ripped from, from everything they knew? What happened to them? They moved to Corinth where they met Paul, who led them to Jesus Christ. We have a guy named Simon, who I'm sure wanted nothing to do with carrying Jesus' cross. 
But through that encounter, he, his wife, and his children become Christ followers. And then later, they minister to the Apostle Paul. Growing Christians learn to view calamities as opportunities because God can use any situation to draw more people to himself. In verse 16, Paul tells us that the Roman Christians, he tells them to greet one another with a holy kiss. Don't you love that verse? Uh, Most (laughs) preachers don't know what to do with it. In ancient times, it was customary to kiss a family member, relative or close friend, on the forehead or both cheeks, especially if you hadn't seen them in quite some time. In the second century, Justin Martyr said that we should greet each other with a kiss whenever we finish praying. Here's why this was so important in the early church. A kiss was a family gesture. This is the way family members treated each other. Now, think about Paul's readers at this time. Some of them had been disowned by their families because they had chosen to follow Jesus Christ. Some of them had lost family members to persecution. Some of them had never known affection because they had been born as slaves. So the church became their family. That's why Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Um, Treat each other like family. That's what he's saying. I like how the Phillips translation puts it. Give each other a hearty handshake all around for my sake. That's probably a better way of applying this in our context, right? Because we don't want to give people the wrong idea by covering them with kisses every time we see them. Now that brings us to the third way we should treat family. Be welcoming, be honoring, and be discerning. Um, Watch out for people whose motives are less than pure. Verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, that is their own desires, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, when we read this paragraph... It may seem out of place amidst a whole list of names, but I don't think it is, and here's why. Any father, any husband, any man who loves his family, what? Wants to protect them and will do so whatever the cost. Paul was their father in the faith, right? He knew God had done a great work in the church at Rome, and he didn't want anyone coming in and destroying that work. That's why he cautions the Roman Christians to watch out for those who would cause divisions and teach false doctrine. And by the way, this isn't the only place where Paul says says this in Scripture. In Acts 20, when Paul left the elders of the church at Ephesus, this is what he said to them. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. That is a good shepherd. He does everything he can to protect his sheep. A good shepherd would carry a staff and a rod. The staff was there to direct the sheep, to gently lead them in the right direction. A rod was used to beat predators, like wolves who wanted to harm the sheep. That's the kind of shepherd we need. We need a shepherd who loves his sheep enough to lead them gently while protecting them at any price. And that's the kind of shepherd we have in Jesus Christ. Now, anytime there's a work of God, Satan will be there to oppose it. We can count on that. Light always attracts bugs, which is why we need a fly swatter. And that's what Paul gives us right here in this passage. Notice what he says in verse 17. I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses. 
What is he saying? Be aware. Don't go to sleep on this. This is too important. Apparently, there were some people in the Roman church who were sowing seeds of disunity, making it more about themselves than the good of the church. So Paul says, note who these people are. Don't let this slip through the cracks. And then at the end of verse 17, he says, avoid them. What do you do with divisive people? You keep your distance from them. Typically, what they're seeking is attention. They want the spotlight for themselves. So don't give it to them. If it's control they're after, and that's what's causing division, they may have to be removed from the fellowship. And there is a procedure for doing that in Scripture. Now, I don't know of any church leader who wants to initiate that process, but we cannot allow selfish ambition to destroy the work of God. That's really what Paul is saying. So, this is how we should treat family. We welcome them, we honor them, and we protect them. As we wrap up, I just want to say this. You know, we live in uncertain times. Isn't that true? That's true socially, politically, economically, worldwide. We live in uncertain times. We've never been more vulnerable than we are right now, which means we need God's power, wisdom, and protection more than ever before. I don't know what the future holds for this country, but I know this. I'd much rather march into it with my spiritual family than without them. I hope you feel the same way. The truth is we need each other. God designed us to be interconnected. We're better together than we could ever be on our own. You know, one of the best ways to express unity in the church is to participate in the Lord's Supper. So that's the way I want to wrap up this Roman series. By remembering what Jesus did for us and giving thanks for his sacrifice on the cross. Jesus came to be a sin substitute. He died in our place so he could be forgiven and accepted and adopted into his family. That's why we make such a big deal of the cross. Without it, we would be separated from God forever. With it, there is hope and forgiveness and new life for anyone, anyone who accepts God's offer of salvation. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for all we have learned in this series about ourselves, about Jesus, about the Spirit, about the church, and about your amazing grace. Use these truths to deepen our faith and make us more like your Son. I ask you to bless this time around your table as we remember and celebrate what Jesus has done on our behalf. We ask this in his strong name. Amen.